say the judge was correct in the context of this appeal, uh, and that he was correct by reference to principles that are well-established and not controversial, uh, and also not derived from Campbell, then I'm going to deal with the question of precedent very briefly as to uh, the reliance on the two exceptions in Young and Bristol Aeroplane, why we say that they don't apply and this court is bound by Campbell. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to deal briefly with why we say anyway Campbell is perfectly aligned with established law uh, and um, that again it's not controversial for that reason, even if uh, your lordship your lordships and your lady were um, of a different view in relation to precedent. So some introductory observations first. The first thing to say is that the the ground of appeal, which is very short and focused, misidentifies or anyway misstates what was in fact the judge's main reason for awarding only one pound damages. And, and, and that is namely, the appeal ground is put as related to what's been referred to throughout this morning as the claimant's litigation misconduct. Now of course the judge did find litigation misconduct and that is not challenged in the appeal. But uh, litigation misconduct is not a freestanding category in and of itself in respect of the correct principles for assessing libel damages, and I'll, I'll come back to that. It, it can cover all sorts of different factors which the courts have recognised are relevant in relation to the assessment. But characterising it as litigation misconduct in this case means that the appeal does not correctly identify the core basis of the judge for the decision to award nominal damages. That core basis was that the litigation misconduct, as it's being called, demonstrated a serious deception on the court and on the defendant which in the judge's judgment was serious and sustained and was serious and sustained dishonesty by the claimant in fact amounting to an attempt to pervert the course of justice now critically for the purpose, purpose of this appeal that dishonesty was relevant in the judge's judgment to assessment of damages in three ways the first way was as being properly before the court, the dishonesty that is, and it was properly before the court because it was central to two of the issues before the court, this is according to the judge, namely one, the claimant's attempt to satisfy the section one serious harm requirement, in other words, to show actual harm, and two, for his claim to be given substantial damages for injury to his reputation. So that was the first basis on which the judge found the dishonesty was relevant to the assessment of damages. The second basis was because the judge recognised that the dishonesty that he had found in the deception of the court, in other words, the lying by the claimant, was in the same sector of the claimant's reputation as the libels in the 14 tweets which the judge had upheld. In other words, again, an accusation of lying, this time um, in tweets against the claimant. Uh, and the third basis for the judge's reasoning that dishonesty was relevant to assessing the damages due was because it led the judge also to conclude that even without the fraudulent case, the deception, the judge would not have awarded the claimant any damages for distress because 
the claimant had not been what the judge described as a witness of truth. So, all in all, it was the judge's recognition that a claimant who should only be compensated for damage to the reputation that he actually possesses that led him to hold two things. First, that it would be unconscionable to award more than nominal damages in these circumstances. And secondly, that there would be no injustice to the claimant in doing that, if those are indeed two different features. In adopting the approach that he did, the judge was following well-established law. He cited, it's true, principally the two first instance decisions of Joseph and Spiller and Flaminau, which are arguably closest to the facts or circumstances which arose across those three cases. But he also applied, as did those two first instance decisions, Joseph and Flaminau, as I will come on to show you a bit later, they applied established principles. And then finally, there was another separate ground on which the judge made clear that it would have led him to reduce the damages in any event, albeit to more than minimal. In other words, if no dishonesty case had occurred. And that was his finding that the claimant had goaded the defendant into some of the tweets complained of in the first place. And on that basis, he had, to use a colloquialism, had brought it on himself to that extent, and a reduction would be due. So in relation to what one might call the Campbell argument, which is being run in this appeal, we say that therefore, even if Campbell is wrong, or not binding, which we will say is not the case, it doesn't matter. Because the judge's reasoning and the decision to award nominal damages were principled, open to him, and unaffected by Campbell or the criticism now being levelled at it. I'm going to now look, as I said I would, briefly at the judge's actual reasoning. There are three places where it's useful to find it, obviously in the trial judgment, but also in the consequential judgment and the consequential argument, for the simple reason that, in this case, at the trial, at the end of the trial, once the deception had come out in the evidence, obviously you would not be surprised to know that the defendant urged the judge to award nominal damages if he was for the claimant on liability. But there was no challenge to that by the claimant's team, and so the judge didn't have to consider any argument about whether it was principled or not. He referred to the authorities and made his decision. Once the consequential hearing happened, which was some months later, it was at that point that the claimant's team had put the Campbell argument together, and so then there was argument on that point. Now, the trial judgment itself, which is in four bundles, tab six, the place to start, and I know I'll do this briefly because I know that you've been taken to some of this already this morning, is paragraph 142, which is at page 84. And this is two paragraphs below the heading relief. 142 is the paragraph where the judge refers to the general approach to the assessment of damages in defamation cases, and he refers to, by law called Justice Warby's statement in Monroe and Hopkins. In particular, the part of the judgment in Monroe and Hopkins which describes uncontroversially the three principal foundations or purposes of general libel damages. One, 
for um, compensation for damage to reputation, two for vindication, and three for distress. Uh, and that's part of what the judge is referring to in 142. But what he says importantly there, uh, again, as a reflection of the authorities that I'll come on to show, in the second sentence he says, it's also well established that a person should only be compensated for injury to the reputation they actually possess. And it's accordingly open to a defendant to adduce evidence of the claimant's bad reputation in mitigation of damages. And again, a reference there to uh, another one of the Northern Justice Warby's first, judge, first instance judge, judgments in La Chaux, um, which I don't think you need to look at now. But just to say that the um, reference, to, and I will come back to it, the reference to bad reputation there is, is not intended, I think, to mean general bad reputation in the sense known by libel practitioners. Uh, in other words, the exception to the Scott and Sampson that specific acts of misconduct are not relevant for the purpose of mitigation um, in order to avoid a roving inquiry into the whole of the claimant's life. Um, so it's not a reference to that sort of bad reputation, I would suggest. It's a reference to broader um, bad conduct, but it may not matter. Um, he then goes on to say, in assessing the proper level of damages or in mitigation, the court can take into account evidence admitted on another issue, which of course is one of the key points being discussed this morning, and gives his citations, which I'll come on to in a bit. Um, he goes on at 143 to refer to the point that I referred to just now about goading which, for your note, he's, also, he's previously referred to in the judgment at paragraphs 121 and 134. In other words, his finding that the um, claimant had goaded the defendant into making some of the tweets. And this is where he says that um, had it not been for Dr. Wright's deliberately false case as to serious harm, a more than minimal award, award would have been appropriate, though the quantum would have been reduced to reflect the fact that Mr. McCormack was goaded into the making statements he did, um, and then his point about also rejecting entirety, in entirety his case on distress. If one put pauses there, <clears throat> it does appear to be clear from that paragraph that had it not been for the dishonest conduct in the context of the trial process, in other words, what he describes as Dr. Wright's deliberately false case as to serious harm. But, but for that feature, the judge would have awarded substantial damages, uh, more than a minimal, reduced to reflect the fact of goading and the fact that there wasn't the distress proved. But nevertheless, one doesn't need to speculate how much it would have been, but it would certainly have been a substantial award of damages. So. What one then is left with is that he reduced what would otherwise have been a substantial award of damages to one pound to reflect what he found to be the unconscionable feature, as he put it, of this case. Uh, have I understood his reasoning correctly? Yeah, I think there's, uh, as I'm going to go on to show, there's a bit more to it than just reflecting the uncon what he regards as the unconscionable part mm. of it. Because in some senses, his description of it being unconscionable is the consequence yes. of what he found as being relevant, which was the dishonesty that came out. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, forgive me. Um, I don't think we're disagreeing in substance. Uh, he, he used the word unconscionable, I think, uh, as a label to describe the conclusion to which he had come. And, and the message that would be sent were he to take any other different yes. decision. Yes. In other words, to award some yes. damages. Yes, so, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it does appear that this is where the issue of principle is joined between you and Lord Wilson. That is it open in law for a judge to say, I would have awarded X damages, 
but I'm not going to award you X damages because of your dishonest conduct in the context of the litigation. Um, I won't be putting it quite as simply as that. Right. Um, and I'll obviously explain why. Hmm. Because it, it, it's important, we say, that it is born of a principled approach yes. to what it is that libel damages are intended to achieve. And the, the, where we join is what do you do in a situation such as this one, where dishonesty comes out in the course of a case, um, and the sting of the libel which has been upheld is also dishonesty. And there's the question then of the nicety, if you like, about um, how you measure what is relevant for the court for that process and for that assessment. Um, but I, 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 as I develop my submissions, I can <coughs> see that, that it's driven by the objective of ensuring that only appropriate vindication or deserving vindication is given. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with that approach. Right, thank you. Um, just picking up a couple of the other parts of the, the judge's judgment, um, in 144, which you looked at just before the adjournment, um, this is, of course, where the, the judge makes his reference to it being unconscionable. Um, and he there pins his colours to the mask that it's a deliberately false case on serious harm advanced until days before trial that requires more than a mere reduction. Uh, he then goes on in 145 and 146 to rely on what um, happened and was said in the judgments in Joseph and Spiller and Flyman now, uh, and in particular, in 145, he cites um, what my Lord, Lord Justice Warby said in Flyman now uh, as to the <coughs> facts that are properly before the court which logically affect the extent to which the claim is entitled to vindicate of its reputation through an award of damages. Um, sorry, that's in 146. Mm. Uh, and again, um, our submission is that that was a perfectly correct interpretation <coughs> by the judge of a correct principle that does not go beyond, um, in terms of its breadth, what the authorities say can be treated as relevant for the purpose of producing damages. Come to authority to, to explain why I say that. Um, and then in 147, which is the um, summary paragraph, the judge then explains that he thinks the same principle as in Joseph and Spiller <coughs> and Primey now applies, and it, which, which I take to mean the, the principle that um, the false evidence and sort of disreputable facts that were properly before the court. Uh, affect the extent to which the claimant is entitled to vindication. Mm. Uh, and so he then explains in 147 that there would be no, ultimately there would be no injustice in, in making the decision that he did to award one pound damages. Now in the consequential judgment, which is at tab 8, which as I say is the, is the place where the argument about um, litigation misconduct in Campbell was first addressed. Yes. The relevant part of the judgment starts at page 98, paragraph 44, under the heading Permission to Appeal. And um, the judge, of course, noted that the point hadn't been taken at <coughs> trial. He, his primary response, or his first reaction, was to say that he was bound by Campbell, as Campbell was being cited, and that the Court of Appeal would be too. But as to the substance of the claimant's argument, the judge identifies at 47, again, starting to set out his reasoning, he, he referred to the three limbs of the purpose of libel damages, which I mentioned just now, including to act as a vindication of the claimant's reputation. In 48, he referred again to the fact that in relation to distress, he wouldn't have awarded anything. Mm -hmm. And then he said um, in 48, 
As to compensation for injury to reputation and vindication of reputation, I found that Mr. McCormick's, Mr. McCormick's publications caused serious harm to Dr. Wright's reputation at the time when they were made, but any damages would have been awarded at the date of my judgment. By that time, Dr. Wright had been shown in a public judgment to have advanced a deliberately false case on an essential part of his claim and to have given deliberately false evidence on oath about it. The question of what award of damages was necessary to vindicate his reputation fell to be assessed on that basis. I found there would be no injustice if he would receive only nominal damages. He then goes on to say he doesn't <coughs> think the analogy with the other torts, such as personal injury, in other words, in full hat and summary, was a good one. And he identifies in 49 the distinguishing features between damages in personal injury claims and in libel claims. He says damages in personal injury claims compensate for injury to interests which are unaffected by the dishonesty. The award needed to make good the injury suffered by a claimant with a broken leg is the same whether the claimant has been honest or dishonest. A libel claimant who has been found in a public judgment to have dishonestly advanced a deliberately false claim, on the other hand, may have so injured his own reputation that an award of substantial damages is no longer called for to vindicate it. If one falls there, if you don't mind, if the use of the word may is intended simply to say that this is an example of where that may be appropriate, I can see that. But speaking for myself, I'm just wondering whether it's always the case that dishonesty is relevant to reputation. Because if, for example, somebody was accused of being a murderer or of being anti-Semitic, and they're found in the trial to have lied about something else, is it necessarily the case that it's going to mean that they shouldn't get any, that they have no reputation at all to protect? No, not necessarily. I mean, and our position is responsible for this appeal is obviously to defend this judge's decision on these facts. And the answer, I suppose, to my Lord's rhetorical question there is in relation to this case, the facts were serious and justified what he did according to the judge. And critically, not without supporting principle or precedent, such as Rahal showed. The word unconscionable pops up here and there. I think when the judge gave judgment on liability, he hadn't had Campbell cited to. No, he hadn't. That's one of the places it appears. But he used the word. And then he used it again here. It's sometimes quite difficult to work out what people mean by unconscionable. Obviously, it means what it means literally, but why should it be thought unconscionable to award damages if otherwise they would be due? I think it's also, as it happens, a word that Mr. Justice Kudinat used in the decision. Did he? Yes. Thank you for finding that. But yes, I mean, my response to that is that, in fact, the use of the word unconscionable is not necessary for this judge's analysis. Because the crux of the facts which he is reflecting on and causing him to make this decision is the deliberately false case. As I said just now, I think, to my name, Lord Justice Singh, the unconscionability is a description, or the unconscionableness is a description, perhaps, of the consequences of letting it lie by giving substantial damages. I don't know exactly why the judge chose the particular word, but that would seem, in our submission, to be a reasonable analysis of it. Yeah, well, I can't find it in Spiller, but it just seems to me, perhaps, it may have some significance if he came up with it without anyone citing it, because I haven't seen it in the other cases. The 
The other place to now have a quick look in relation to the judge's reasoning is in the... There's a transcript of the argument that led to him making his judgment on the, at the consequential hearing, mm -hmm. including on the commission of the appeal, which is in the supplemental... Um, the slim supplemental binding. Yes. And it's tab three. And it's not... It's obviously not always desirable or helpful to look at the argument to search for what a judge judge was thinking or what the was behind the reasoning. But in this case, as I say, because Campbell hadn't been referred to until this point, uh, it's important. And the exchange which I've asked you to look at on page 38 um, it is particularly important. And we're on page 38? Um, if you start at page 13, yes. top left, there, there's an exchange with um, Mr. Callas, who was on his feet with the application for permission to appeal yes. then, uh, in which the judge, on, being, on it being suggested to him that the all hat and the Summers cases meant that Campbell had gone wrong, the judge distinguishes there between personal injury damages approach, approaches and libel. And it goes down to the um, start of page 14. Yes. And then you'll see that Mr. Callas picks it up and says that may be the case in relation to the important difference in, in between personal injury and libel in the, in the interest being reputation that's been protected. Mm. He says... Um, Come on to Broome Castle. Obviously, one can see this is line seven. Obviously, one can see why it would be relevant in this case whether or not the defamatory imputation sued upon itself relates to honesty. Though so certainly in defamation cases where honesty is not remotely part of the government of the libel, it's very difficult to see why the honesty of the claimant or otherwise would have any bearing at all on whether or not he's entitled to be vindicated as to whether or not he's a murderer. The point about defamation is that it's the vindication of a particular reputation. Now, all of us we would agree with. Yes. It can't be said that somebody who has been dishonest, therefore, in whatever segment of his life, is not entitled to vindication of his reputation. And then, on the next page, 15, jumping down, um, mm -hmm. at the end of Mr. Callas's submission at 5, he, he concedes there that there might be, might be a slightly harder case to make on a case such as the present, where dishonesty is part of the gravamen of the libel. And the judge says the gravamen of the libel in this case was a statement by Mr. McCormack that your client was a fraud. And Mr. Callas says, haven't you then cited the actual meaning? And the judge said, yes, and I found that your client was dishonest in the course of seeking to establish his claim. So the significance of that is if there's any doubt about uh, some of the features in the reasoning and the thinking of the judge that led him to make the award, that disposes of that doubt because it shows that very much at the heart of his thinking was the relationship between, on the one hand, the libel that was complained about, fortunately came into the greater effect one, and on the other hand, the um, claim to have vindicatory damages for having a good reputation, despite having run a deliberately false case, case at the trial. So it's about the overlap in the sectors of reputation, which is not always present in, in some of the other cases. Uh, for example, arguably in Campbell, it's not um, certainly clearly present. Right. And if I understand it right, you're, you're putting this as a, an instance of at least as far as the judge's reasoning is concerned, an instance of the rule that you don't get damages for a reputation you don't have. Or deserve. Or deserve, yes. So you put it both ways. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the passages you've cited so far are have. And as we all know, um, judgments, however damning, don't always get a lot of publicity. They don't, don't necessarily actually lead to any particular reputational consequences. Um, but you're, you're, you're no doubt 
speaks to them as the very stuff of reputation. Yes, um, among other authorities, yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> in particular, the, and the, the public message that it's intended to contain. Mm. Um, my Lord and, and you are much more familiar with this area of law than I am, uh, but I've read some of the authorities and I've seen the word sector and, and you've used it in your submissions as well. Uh, by sector, in this context, do you mean dishonesty as opposed to, for example, being accused of being a murderer? Yes, I mean in this context, um, the sector of your reputation which conveys that you're an honest person. Yes, yes. Well, see, I understand that and, and, and I can see the authorities which support that proposition, but Speaking for myself, I, I, I'm not sure it, it strikes me immediately as being correct as a matter of principle to say, well, the sector is dishonesty because, for example, in the criminal context, we're well used to directing juries that somebody can be dishonest for one purpose. That doesn't mean that they're lying in front of you. So that they may have told a lie about whether they did something else when they were at school or at university or they may have lied because they wanted to avoid telling people they were having a marital affair or something of that sort. But it doesn't mean that they've lied to you about the offence of which they're accused. So, so in this context, is it right that sector just is as broad as, well, he's lied and therefore he has no reputation of honesty to defend at all? Well, we, we would suggest that it is. <coughs> I mean, you know, these cases are going to be fact sensitive. Aren't yes. But we would suggest that you can put it that broadly and that that's what some of the older authorities do. Yes. Uh, and actually we'll see that in Jones and Pollard um, it, it's actually suggested that perhaps the, the, the need to talk about clear categories and sectors um, is a little bit over the top and it could be more blurred. Right. So it, it's um, I mean it, it may be a peculiarity of, of the field but it's certainly there in the cases that this well, and, and the other thing just to say about that is that logically one would expect that in many cases of so-called litigation misconduct, mm. there's going to be an element of dishonesty involved in that because it's not going to be an example of someone whose misconduct consists of them driving into the precinct of the court and smashing their car against the wall. Mm. It's likely to be some sort of perverting the course of justice type mm. situation. But that doesn't mean that the claimant who's come to court saying, I need to be vindicated because I've been called a liar, should have it ignored mm. that he lied to the court to get there. Yes. And that's, the, that's why this judge called it a central feature of the case. Right. Um, one other thing just to say on that, in case I forget to mention it later on, is that the other important point about this case and the time in which it's happened and some of the older cases, which is true, many of them are jury cases, is that this case was also in the era of serious harm. So although it's true that there were no substantive defences being fought at the trial, serious harm is a threshold issue. Uh, and so the evidence that was before the court was particularly carefully scrutinised for that reason. Um, and we would suggest that setting a bar for such cases, libel cases, where serious harm is required, which don't acknowledge the importance of this, uh, the overlapping sector point when it comes to vindication, will be um, understating the bar, uh, under pitching the bar for serious harm, and almost as a matter of policy, underplaying the importance over that uh, I was going to come next to look at the legal principles that the judge applied in a bit more detail and why we say he was correct. Um, we su suggest that the judge's decision to award a pound damages was based on his understanding of three key well-established principles in this field, none of which are challenged on this appeal. The first, and I've already touched on some of this, the first is the function of libel damages 
to provide appropriate vindication of the claimant's reputation. And this was described by my Lord, Lord Justice Warby in the Permission to Appeal Reasons as a guiding principle unique to libel, paragraph 7. The second is that any relevant facts which are properly before the trial judge may go to reduce damages. Because logically, this reputable fact, the fact showing the claimant in, we would suggest, the bad light, affect the extent to which the claimant is entitled to vindication through a damages war. Well, this is obviously necessarily where the claimant has succeeded on liability. And again, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby described that in paragraph 7 of his reasons for this appeal as the established rule. And I think the, the phrase disreputable facts actually uh, came initially from the Slimy Now judgment as well. Um, Self citation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the third principle is, um, I think, it hasn't featured this morning, I think, but that, that in the appropriate case, a reduction in damages can be to vanishing point, in other words, nominal damages, assuming, of course, that the rest of the decision is yes. a sound one. Yes, I, I, I didn't understand Lord Wolfson to make any no. uh, submission to the contrary. If we reach that stage of the analysis, yes. I think what he says is, actually to embark on this exercise in the first place was wrong in law. Yeah. So I think it's going to be helpful to, to trace those three principles to see how they operate and, and see how well established they are um, through the authorities and, and also to show that they don't actually come from Campbell. That Campbell reflects some of them. So the first one is the, is the principle of the function that the function of libel damages provide appropriate vindication of the payment reputation. If one goes to look at, um, again, my Lord Lord Justice Walker's judgment in Monroe at paragraph 75, and that's in the supplemental authority bundle, tab 7. Monroe and Hopkins was a, a trial about um, a spat on Twitter, uh, and the section I'm taking you to is uh, the section dealing with the, the remedies the claimant yes. succeeded. Um, and it's simply for the general statement. You'll see there that um, in 75 set out the well-known section from John against Mirror Group newspaper, Exeter Thomas Bingham. Yes. And I don't need to repeat, that's where you get the three heads um, of libel da damages from. Yes. And if you go to 76, you'll see that what um, my Lord Lord Justice will be said was that heads one and two, in other words, compensation and vindication, can be seen as complementary or overlapping. And this is what we stress here, because the overall aim of compensation is as usual in the case of civil law. So this is the restitution point, to restore the claimant to the position they would have been in if the wrong had not been committed. Yes. Now, it, critically, it follows from this that assessment of damages, general damages, I'm, I'm, I'm only talking about general damages, assessment of damages for libel requires a knowledge of the worth of the claimant's reputation. And, and this is the next principle um, which I'll make good. It, it's another decision of the Lord Justice Morby, this time in the Lachaud decision at first instance, mm -hmm. which the judge also referred to, which is at tab six, the same bundle. Okay. Paragraph 74. was a newspaper libel case, uh, and this was the judgment on the question of serious harm. And it, it's important to read paragraph 74. 
ratio of the decision in Dingle, which we don't need to look at here, but what he goes on to say, is however not that it is irrelevant to consider the state of a person's reputation at the time the work is intended to the public. The common law has always recognised that a person should only be compensated for injury to the reputation they actually possess. That's that point. A defendant may prove in mitigation that a person has a bad reputation as a relevant sector of his life. The common law has, however, developed rules as to the means by which such a matter may be proved, or put another way, the evidence which is admissible to establish it. But that's quite a neat encapsulation of uh, how the objective of giving appropriate vindication and the means to achieve it fit together. The means of achieving it over the years has developed through the mitigation categories that my learned friend took you to that Gatley listed them, which are also in our Skelton argument. Not all of which are relevant to this case. So the short point so far on those principles is that in order to assess what is appropriate vindication and compensation there, some knowledge of the worth of the claimant's reputation at the time of the assessment has to be achieved by the court. If one looks next at the Turner Court of Appeal decision, um, in, also in the supplementary bundle, paragraph 4, in the judgment of Lord Justice Keane at 29 and 30, page 71. Uh, you'll see this is quite a helpful passage uh, under the heading at page 71 at, at a matter of legal principle. And although this case was about the Burstein principle, about correctly relevant background context for mitigation, it, it does contain some general observations and following in relation to the general approach to damages. And he sets out um, the relevant part of um, Scott and Sampson and Mr. Justice Kay, which established the principle which I mentioned in the begin at the beginning of this, uh, which was that it had become acceptable that you could adduce evidence of someone's general bad reputation in mitigation, but not Acts, specific acts of misconduct by that person, saving certain particular situations, uh, and that the reason for that was effectively what we would now call case management, because if you were to allow the specific acts of misconduct to be investigated at the trial, it could lead to a roving inquiry without any sort of control, bear in mind this was jury time. Um, but you'll, you'll, get, you'll see, and this is the main reason for referring to this, um, he says at F, it will be seen that the justification for this exclusionary principle is in large part a practical one. That's the point I just made. Mm. Um, it also seems that Cave J was concerned about the lack of relevance of such evidence to the issue in the case, since it would have, would have but a very remote bearing on the question in dispute. And then he cites in 30, says, in any event, there can be no doubt that the principle in Scott and Sampson was approved by the House of Lords in Schneider's case, which was in turn analysed in the Burstein's case. And then, um, if one goes over to page 73, there's further citation from Scott and Sampson at the top which concludes um, in relation to mitigation by saying, seeing that the law does not permit a defendant in mitigation of damages to produce evidence that tends to justification, it must permit him to produce the same self same evidence which when pleaded in partial justification, which was um, Hampton's point. If it were not so, and this is the point I'm addressing, the plaintiff would recover damages for a character which he did not possess or deserve, and this law will not permit. And then he says at B, one notes that final reference to preventing a plaintiff 
what that leads one into is an understanding of the starting point in a libel in the libel context, which is a presumption that every claimant that comes forward begins with a good reputation, unless that's rebutted. Which again is why it's necessary for the assessing court being asked to award damages to assess the kind of reputation that that claimant actually had at the time of the assessment. Otherwise, appropriate vindication could not be given. And then one sees, for example, in Duncan and Neil, again, to make the point, so it's the main authority bundle, paragraph 13, It's page 376 in the bottom right. And actually, it starts on the previous page at the bottom of the heading, the reputation of the claimants. And this is, again, part of the analysis of the mitigating factors. And it says at 25.21, the matter of common sense, it's relevant to consider the reputation that the claimant had before the publication took place. And then a footnote. And then the footnote says, since the good reputation of the claimant is presumed, there is no need for the claimant to assert and prove that they had a good reputation. So that's another established principle. Similarly, um, in the important decision of Campton, which is tab two, of of the supplement, supplementary one, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. If you turn to page, um, the internal page number 124, so page 19 on the bottom right. Yes. Um, I should just say this is, I mean, this is. Captain is a case, again, in the jury era, where the plaintiff was awarded half a peak in damage um, on the back of uh, a jury trial. And it's famously the case uh, which established the entitlement to partially justify on the defendant's part as a way of reducing the damages. But it, it isn't limited to that. Uh, that one feature. So if, if one looks at the, the judgment of Lord Justice Oliver at page 124, at F, um, actually if you start at um, C to D, you'll see just before D that he describes how at the trial before Bristow J, the plaintiff had been compelled to admit to the appropriateness of the adjective slippery and unscrupulous <coughs> in relation to his behaviour. Uh, and that became relevant because although the main sting of the libel was not proven, nevertheless those admissions became important. Mm. And he goes on to say the jury, although they rejected the pleas of fair comment and justification with regard to this particular description, had to consider and quantify the loss of reputation suffered as a result. This was a man who had achieved and deliberately achieved the widest notoriety as the centre of a thoroughly disreputable scheme for avoiding payment in relation to um, Parkinson's case, for which he was responsible. And then down between E and F, it says the jury were entitled to ask themselves the question whether, even assuming that the word spin, which was part of what was complained about, may not have been wholly apposite, its use could be said to have caused its use could be said to have caused any real damage to the reputation of a man who, by his openly avowed action, had forfeited any right to be regarded as a good general reputation. My class, I found a verdict one which, given this background, the jury could quite possibly reach for a man who openly and avowedly behaved like a rascal, suffered little further damage than his already sullied reputation by being categorised as a rascal of a slightly different type. Mm. And we would suggest that that's, that's a prime example of this overlapping of the sectors. Mm. Um, another way of putting these principles. 
is, is the um, disavowal of obtaining the invitation on a false basis, which is sometimes how it's put. And I don't think I need to take you to it, but in Mr. Justice Nicklin's more recent case of Bukova against Associated Newspapers at 9, paragraph 29, sub 6, uh, he states that principle there. One of the purposes of litigation is to avoid the invitation on a false basis. Mm. Uh, also referred to by the judge. It's also relevant to bear in mind that the human rights obligation in respect to balancing Article 8010 here, because obviously any award to the claimant needs to be no more than necessary, to use a shorthand, to give appropriate vindication. And um, again, this is a, a, something that was addressed by Mr. Justice Nicklin in the Riley case um, at same bundle at tab 10, which I suppose is giving us a slightly more modern twist than some of the approaches in the older cases. It's paragraph 135 on page 275. Sorry, it's page 276. And he's actually um, in the long paragraph 135, <coughs> setting out the summary of my Lord and Justice Warby's from the Baron and Vines case, a, a summary of the approach to be taken to uh, awarding damages and assessing damages. And at the last of the sub paragraph set out, 8, on page 276, says any award needs to be no more than is justified by the legitimate aim of protecting reputation necessary in a democratic society due to that only proportion to that need. Of course, this, this limit is nowadays statutory via the Human Rights Act. Um, one thing just to say at this point before I go on to the second principle. Um, one of the things that my learned friend said this morning a couple of times uh, was that he referred to some of these principles in the cases as being directed at punishing the claimant in a case for, let's just call it sort of misconduct. Um, but whilst it's true that some of the language of sanction is seen in the Summers case, for example, it's certainly not the language that's used in any of the libel cases in justifying the approach to getting the vindication right. Um, and in fact, one sees from Broome, and we can come on to look at it, but in Broome, which was about exemplary damages, I mean, that's the, that was the only context in this field where punishment, uh, if it's indeed regarded as appropriate, in the end, they find it wasn't appropriate to call it that because it's exemplary damages, but the punitive nature is accepted in that context, but certainly not uh, as the basis for depriving a claimant of damages. It's not a punishment. It's Does it come to this, that everyone's agreed in this courtroom that this case is only about general damages? And general damages are designed to compensate for harm caused. And, it, and I think your submission amounts to this, does it? that in, in asking the question, what is the harm caused, which is the general tortious principle, there's nothing odd about defamation here, in the specific context of defamation, that becomes, what is the actual reputation this man had right. at the time that I'm doing the assessment? Right. And, and, if, and if, the relevant, if in the relevant sector he hasn't got a reputation to protect, there is no harm, and therefore there's nothing to compensate for. Right. So that's, that's very much part of it, and there's also the part which I've touched on, which I'm going to come back to in more detail about the, the public message that gets sent well, that, through that, an award. Yeah, well that, that, that's, you may be right, <laughs> I'm not saying you're not right. The, the authorities uh, are quite No, I'm I, 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 subject to the reply, uh, let's take that as a given. I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to analyse it in terms of what the principles are. Um, I like to think 
common law has a certain coherence and its principles, and authorities tend, tend usually, one hopes, to, to coincide with principles. Yes, well, we, I mean, certainly, our, our, as I said at the beginning, our submission, our overarching submission, is that there's nothing, nothing has happened in this case that isn't consistent with principles which have been there for a long time. Right. Um, well, your basic position is, is it not, that, that, that you're compensating for the harm to the damage to reputation which actually occurs, and therefore you can't artificially stop the clock running at the date of publication. You've got to look at what is this person's reputation and what is going to be done by the court to vindicate it. And in doing that, you can't artificially, certainly where there's an overlapping sector, which you say there is here, you can't artificially say, um, well, he behaved badly in relation to the conduct of the litigation um, by effectively lying to the court um, and putting forward a fraudulent claim. And the, 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 the nub of the allegation against him is that he, he was a liar and a fraud in relation to something else. Um, so you put that all into the mix and you work out what is enough um, within the confines of the Human Rights Act to vindicate that reputation. Yes. Um, I mean, that is it, and it's, it, the reason it's not an injustice is precisely because that balance is carried out. Mm. Um, you know, it isn't, it, the other point to make is that these cases don't happen very often. Mm. You know, claimants don't tend to do what happened in this case, generally. Now, I think my Lord will seem to point that, the Justice will seem to point that, of course, people lie in court all the time. Um, but there is a difference between that and what, as in this case, has been found to be an actual deception on the court, as, as was found also in the Spiller case, you know, deliberately intended to, to effectively hoodwink the court and the opponent, right from almost the start of the proceeding, uh, on the basis of a case that wasn't true. The irony is that you probably might find it more, more, more apparent in personal injury cases than you will here. Well, yes, I can see that you know, from the point of view of um, there's quite a lot of that injury going on. and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Um, right. So you were showing us uh, Riley and Murray. Is there anything else in that case? No, that's that's all that. Um, I mean, okay. it's worth it, it's it's a, a collation of important principles. So it's a useful resource. But yes. Um, I wanted to just mention one other point on this last point about um, correctly assessing the, the state of the reputation of the claimant. One of the suggestions from a learned friend this morning, I think, was that one solution might be that you could reduce any aggravated damages that might be claimed mm. as a way of marking a disapproval or mm. um, for some other specific purpose. Um, but in this case, for example, the aggravated damages claim was dropped mm. from the client. Um, and although claimants individual claimants usually do plead aggravated damages pleas. In effect, all that an aggravated damages plea usually is, is a, a bid for higher damages because of the extent of the hurt that's been felt as a result of the libel. So um, it wouldn't deal with the, if you like, the justice of the situation and the overlapping sector that you just reduce aggravated damages because you'd still be saying, oh, but OK, here are your, here's your large general damages, even though you're a, you lied to the court. Um, the, the second principle, which I said I wanted to delve into a little bit more, is, is the one which my Lord, Lord Justice will be described as the established rule, uh, which is that any relevant facts which are properly before the court mm. or, or emerge before the trial judge may go to reduce damages. And as I said a little while ago, logic, that is very often likely to be evidence of acts of misconduct, hence its relevance to mitigation. Um, the best place to start for this is in Pamphlet, which is in the Supplemental Authorities Bundle at Tab 2, which we went to briefly just now. As I said, it's usually regarded largely as the authority for the ability to reduce damages by partial justification. Um, but the principle does, it's stated in that case, does go wider than 
and you'll see if you turn to the judgment of Lord Justice Neil at page 120, and further on 120, at um, A to B, So he's just been talking about um, evidence, you'll, you'll see this at page 119B to E. There he was just talking about evidence which relates solely to the plaintiff's general bad reputation. But at the top of 120, he says so much for evidence which is directed solely to establishing the plaintiff's previous bad reputation. But a defendant is also entitled to rely on mitigation of damages on any other evidence which is properly before the court and jury. This other evidence can include, so it's not shutting off um, other examples, evidence which has been primarily directed to, for example, a plea of justification or a fair comment. Uh, and then if, if you drop down, he then explains uh, one of the niceties of former libel law in section 5 and section 6 of the 52 Act. If you drop down to D, he says there may be many cases, however, where a defendant who puts forward a defence of justification will be unable to prove sufficient facts to establish the defence at common law, and will also be unable to bring himself within the statutory extension. Nevertheless, the defendant may be able to rely on such facts as he has proved to reduce the damages, and this is the genesis of this phrase, perhaps almost to vanishing Thus, a defence of partial justification that may not prevent the plaintiff from succeeding on the issue of liability may be of great importance on the issue of damages. So that's the well-known statement in relation to partial justification. Now, if you turn to um, Jones and Pollard, which tab 11 of the same bundle, Another court of appeal decision. I think um, Justice Warby was in as counsel for the defendant. Um, this case is quite important because it's it's referred to, as you'll see when we come on to Campbell, it's referred to in Campbell as being the source of the statements of general principle which Campbell then sets out. Page two hundred and I'll just tell you about the facts. The, the claimant was accused of having been um, involved in KGB while living in Moscow and um, running prostitutes and so forth, um, or rather allowing his flat to be used by men for the sex of prostitutes. And it's another example of a case where there was um, an attempt at justification, not all of which succeeded. Uh, and I think it's important just to pick up some of the detail of what was an issue in that case. So if you go to page 239, the second half of that page sets out the natural and ordinary meaning which the plaintiff has relied on in his statement of claim. Uh, that the plaintiff was a pimp, he was party to blackmail a foreign businessman, his motivation for the above is that he received favourable treatment from the KGB and free sex from the prostitute. And then at the bottom of that page it says the only substantive defence was one of justification to which the defendant sought to justify the following meanings. Uh, and then there are three of them, A, B, C. And he says, uh, I shall refer to these in future as justification A, B, and C, respectively. And then, in effect, what happened, what happened was that justification A went forward and was tried. And then justifications B and C, which in the middle of that page, you see the particulars are set out. But those particular justifications B and C were ultimately struck out and you see that from um, page 251, which <coughs> I'll come on to in a minute. But before that, if you go to page 243, 
I should say this is in the judgment of Lord Justice Hurst, who was um, one of the defamation specialists in those days in the Court of Appeal. Um, page 243, the middle block is where you see the list of six relevant um, factors appropriate to take into account in considering damages. And those are the six <coughs> that are repeated in Campbell verbatim for paragraph 26. Now, at the bottom of page 243, you see um, it says, underlying the issues which arise in relation to reduction of damages under item 4, which is matters tending to reduce damages, including evidence given at the trial, which, which the jury are entitled to take into account in accordance with Campbell. There are important issues of mixed fact and law as to the proper approach to be adopted to evidence affecting the plaintiff's existing reputation. In particular, how far, if at all, are the jury and how far, if at all, are we entitled to take into account evidence at the trial which have been adduced to support justifications B and C, seeing that those two pleas were subsequently ruled out by the judge. Uh, and then he says, I'll refer to these questions in future as the issues in reduction of damages. And then if you go forward, page 249, there you see the heading issues in reduction of damages. And there's a long citation there from the paragraphs in the Pamplin case, which I've just put you to, for the judgment of Lord Justice Neal, <coughs> um, including at the bottom of page 250 the statement um, from Pamplin that the defendant is also entitled to rely on litigation and any other evidence properly before the court. And then finally one comes to page 251 and you'll see that in the middle it says um, Mr. Caldcott placed strong reliance on the statements that the evidence must relate to the relevant sector of the plaintiff's life in fact, and then he says um, drop down a couple of lines but in my, and this is the point I touched on a little earlier in my judgment the court should not be too astute to draw too precise boundaries between various sectors of the plaintiff's life particularly where there is some linkage, albeit perhaps indirect, between the matters relied upon in reduction of damages and the sector of the plaintiff's life primarily under consideration. Um, and then this is the key bit, last paragraph there. Mr. Caldicott expects that the plaintiff's general bad reputation for as far as it goes, and also any admissions made by him in the course of the proceeding are potentially admissible in reduction of damages though he says they're outside the relevant sector. And then this is the important bit. He also accepts that any evidence which went to justification A is potentially admissible for the same purpose. But he strongly objects to the court taking into account answers elicited in cross-examination directed to justifications B and C, which he submits must be disregarded ex post facto by reason of the striking out of those two pleas. And Lord Justice Hurst then says, I am unable to accept this submission. It seems to me to go against the principles clearly laid down in pamphlet that the defendant is able to rely on, quote, such facts as he has proved, unquote, in reduction of damages. Furthermore, it seems to me proper for this court to assume that answers from the plaintiff's own witnesses, given in cross-examination and unaffected by re-examination, must have been accepted by any reasonable jury. Now, I've gone through that in a little bit of detail just because it, it's important because it shows very clearly that these principles are well established but it also shows that perhaps in answer to some of the questions this morning about the nature of the evidence before the judge in this case uh, uh, and some of the submissions that were made about whether it could be characterised as evidence because it was Variously, some of it was adduced in cross-examination as to credit, for example. But, but this, we suggest, is a clear answer to that point that was raised by Manon's friend this morning. I think it on part of what Mr Justice Nicklin said in clear 
is a red herring. Uh, and that, that there's no question that the phrase from Pamphlin, such facts as he has proved in reduction of damages, is a broad one. And there's no, in our submission, we would suggest anyway, there's no principled reason why the evidence that comes out from a witness in a trial, let alone a party, which ultimately the judge holds to be dishonest evidence, could be shut out because it's, it wasn't formally part of his case when he was being put in I think the point that was being made against you is not so much that you shut out that evidence, but the judge's fact finding is not evidence. So there, the, the distinction I think that Wilson was trying to, to make is, is between evidence properly so called, which may be given of course by the defendant or by another witness or somebody else in the case, or maybe in the document, and a finding on credibility or uh, something of that nature by the judge himself, which is not in fact evidence. Uh, I did understand it in that way as mm. well, mm. but um, I, mean, I must confess I have some difficulty with it because it, the reason that the findings came about is because evidence was put before the court, <coughs> yes. which led the judge to make the finding. A and importantly, it, it was not just about cross examination as to credit, it was centrally part of the case that the claimant came to court to give evidence on as to his case on serious harm. And he had had to abandon it the week before the trial when the defendant discovered witnesses who were able to show that what he'd said was not true. Those defendant witnesses were witnesses in the case, albeit on hearsay statements at the trial. And the cross examination of the claimant related to his new case, which was, well, I did still suffer serious harm, but I did still experience this invitation just it wasn't in the way I originally said it was. So in our submission, there was, there was plenty of evidence, proper evidence, before the court, which became relevant in assessing the state of the reputation of the claimant and the entire... <coughs> evidence that he was dishonest. Yeah, evidence that he was dishonest, but also evidence in relation to his case on serious harm. You know, it had a function in the case, because he was trying to rely on it to show that he had suffered actual harm. I mean, the, the passages of the judge's judgment where he makes this clear are uh, in the trial judgment 59 to 61 and 63 to 69. I don't think you need to look at them now, but the, the judge is quite careful in explaining the chronology of how the new case came about and, and the mm -hmm. fact that the claimant, nevertheless, at trial persisted in an adapted version of the case. <coughs> the um, the pamphlet in the Jones and Pollard line of cases was uh, also cited by Lord Justice Keane in Turner. Um, but, um, Four of the supplemental bundles, paragraphs 42 to 46, in my opinion, um, addresses the question of what can properly go before a jury. Uh, and he says just ahead of that, actually, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 43, he cites pamphlet. And then in 45, he says, um, Hampton was followed in another 43 decision, Jones and Pollard. And it was held by this court in that case that the jury had been entitled to take into account the assessing damages the evidence put before them concerning the particular justification eventually struck out, so long as the evidence related to the relevant sector of the plaintiff's life. He does then say at 46, it's of course important to recognise such evidence is restricted to that which can properly go before a jury in support of a plea of justification and fair comment, which is the point picked up by Mr Justice Nixon in the Deer case, paragraph 118, where he questions um, respectfully the, the narrowing 
you're just this feeling that sound. Of a statement which it's clear from Pamphlet is, is, is not limited to justification and fair comment. As I've just, sh just shown you, and, and through the Jones and Pollard um, analysis of it. In relation to Joseph and Spiller and Fly Me Now, um, both, as I said, both first instance decisions that this judge, um, Mr. Justice Chamberlain, considered and, and followed as to their approach, in particular their reliance on the principle that only appropriate vindications should be given through damages, and that any relevant facts should be charged on and relied on to reduce them. In other words, the established rule. Um, in, in Joseph and Spiller, Mr. Justice Tumat found that it was a serious dishonesty, misconduct, intended to pervert the course of justice, just like in this case. He also characterised it as an abusive process, and that it would be unjust for nominal damages to be awarded. He said he requires no further vindication of his rights than what was in the judgment. Uh, in Fly Me Now, Lord, Lord Justice Willoughby's decision not a dissimilar scenario. It emerged in the trial that the claimant's main witness, the director of the company, had fabricated, fabricated some of the evidence. It's true to say that in that case there was also a partial justification and there was conduct as between the claimant and the defendant closer to, time, <coughs> closer to the time of the publication. But nonetheless, this is um, where our Lord Lord Justice will be found that the disreputable fact, including the lie to the court, mm. the deliberately false case. Did my Lord, I can't, <coughs> I can't remember now, I'm afraid, uh, did my Lord in that judgment use the phrases abuse of process or unconscionability? I don't think so. Well, I addressed the um, question of whether the, the claim was an abuse of process and rejected it, as Lord Wolfson pointed out earlier. So it wasn't part of the reasoning on the damages. No. Yes, but that, that, if I may say so, speaking for myself, is of some interest because that may suggest that what's really going on here in this sector of the common law is no different conceptually from what happens in every other field of the law of torts, which is that you only compensate for harm actually done. And the question then becomes, in the case of a broken leg, one can see the broken leg. In the case of a broken reputation, you can't necessarily see it, but you have to assess what is this reputation? Uh, was the reputation capable of being broken? Is, is that what it comes down to? Well, I think it's, uh, it also comes down to the, the final point on this principle that I'm going to come on to now, which is this the function of the damages as being a way of sending a public message. Yes. That the reputation, the good reputation, which is presumed at the start, has been restored. That's the vindication point. Is it? That's the vindication point, and it's almost, I mean, it's a policy objective as yeah. much as anything else, because it's about ensuring that, you know, as was said this morning, I, I think a number of people in this room, that the impossibility of actually scientifically coming up with a figure in a, in a mm. personal injury or libel court because we're talking about non-pecuniary law means that you have to find a way to reach an assessment mm. that does achieve justice obviously in this particular court vindication of an appropriate sort but, but also that doesn't um, undermine as a matter of policy the very purpose of that mechanism a and mm. by sending a message out that somebody who's come to court with a fabricated case who was asking to be vindicated for having been called a liar gets £50,000 or even £15,000 damages it is in our submission contrary to the policy which ought to be that these things are kept 
in proportion, and that there should be a reflection of, if you like, if not condemnation, anyway, a mark of what has happened, mm. and the fact that that person's reputation has not come out of that trial in a yes. healthy state. Yes. You may be right. Oh. Forgive me. Um, you may be right, but, but this is where I think Lord Wilson would have a complaint to make, which is that this is not consistent, apparently, with the general approach of the law of torts, because uh, it's, it's sort of predicated on the assumption that there is some damage, there is some harm caused, which would otherwise be compensated for, but because you're a very bad person, we're not going to compensate you. Well, except we wouldn't characterise it as being because you're a very bad person. Right. It's because you've asked for a message to be sent that you're of good character in relation to the love you've complained about. And the way we're going to say that you are a good character because the libel is not held, mm. is we're going to send a message, the court is going to send a message of a certain amount of damages. Mm. What that doesn't do is allow for the fact that that person's reputation has not come out of the trial restored yeah. for good. Well, well, that, 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 it might be described as a pyrrhic victory in the yeah. sense that yeah. it's the opposite. Yeah. Insofar as it's saying, saying the same thing as you didn't have a reputation, therefore there is no harm, and therefore there's no right to compensation. I perfectly understand that. But insofar as it's a distinct point from that, that may be supported by authority. But I have more difficulty in following it. Can I, can I try this? Because I was interested in the uh, what you said about sending out a, a, a public message that the good reputation that you start with has been restored. Just as in a personal injury case, you would uh, <coughs> reduce the general damages to the extent that somebody is responsible um, for part of the injury, contributing negligence. So in a case where the claimant himself or herself is, to a measure, responsible for sullying his own reputation in the course of the trial, could one not say that that is a principal basis for drawing an analogy and saying, well, you're, you're not in a position, court, to restore a good reputation because the claimant himself has materially contributed to that reputation becoming sullied uh, and it can never go back to where it was and that has to be reflected in some way in reducing the amount of compensation that vindicates the reputation. Well, I've not put that very elegantly. No, but I think it's a fair way. Of, it captures... I, mean, and, and I do think a lot of this is about policy and it, it does capture that. But it, the other, if you like, the other side of the coin is that if my Lord Lord Justice Singh is right that there isn't this, um, let's put it, a unique approach or principle in mind that puts the importance of vindication in the centre in this way and allows it to have this impact in a case where you've otherwise succeeded. It, it does seem to be a bit of a green light for any libel claimant to come to court and lie and always be able to say, but I've won my libel case. And it doesn't matter that I stitched everybody up and I got it on the back of the lie. Because, yeah, I'll be penalised in court. You might be sent to prison. But, I, I've sent people to which, prison for lying to the court. Why? And, and, but, as, but as your Lordship pointed out before, I mean, it, it happens a lot. And what's unusual about this case is it happened actually in the trial itself and was found out initially by the defendant's side doing some digging. But, but, but nevertheless, the point is, that if your lordship is right, it would suggest that a libel claimant would find it difficult to ever lose out on an award of substantial damages, whatever he or she did in the course of reversing the course of justice, because of what you're suggesting could be an unprincipled discipline. Forgive me. If I, 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 first of all, I have no concluded views whatsoever on any part of this case. Uh, but secondly... Uh, that wasn't actually the point I was putting. Uh, I, I entirely understand the force of the point, that if by lying to the court <coughs> you have demonstrated that you have no reputation in the relevant sector,
therefore there is no harm, therefore there is nothing to be compensated. All of that I understand. So you wouldn't be in the scenario you're painting. You wouldn't get damages, actually. Yes, well, I mean, I, I completely take on board that. I mean, that's, that's a fair way of putting it. But it, it, it seems to amount to the same, same scenario in the end, which is that it's, it's an attempt to ensure that a message is not sent out about the state of somebody's yes. reputation on a false basis. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Ms. Evans. I, I, I'm conscious that I've probably distracted you from the uh, course you would otherwise have taken. No, so, and, and, no. and there's obviously we have to keep an eye on the clock as mm. well. No, I, I'm, I'm actually just about to come on to dealing with this uh, question about the public message. But yes. I mean, I can do that quite shortly. Right. Um, I'm just going to look at a couple of authorities that make this point quite well, I think. But one is actually in um, Justice Gordon's um, Blimey Now decision, judgment in the main authority Sunday, tab 9, Paragraph 128 on page 294. Now, it's a, it's a passage that you've seen already, uh, read to you or read yourselves a number of times, I suspect, and I want to just emphasize one part of it. Uh, it's the sentence that says, those two are disrupted logically affect the extent to which the claimant is entitled to the vindication of its reputation and this, this is the stress word through an award of damages. So in other words it's it's the sense that the vindication is being sent through the award itself, i.e. the public message, which is coming back to um, the brief discussion earlier on about the use of the phrase, the use of the word unconscious. It, it may be that that's a good example of why the word unconscionable is a good one to describe the consequences of not sending a public message through reduced damages. It would be unconscionable not to do that because the vindication of reputation is through the award of damages. Put another way, it would be giving the court's imprimatur to bad behaviour during the proceeding in the same sector as the claimant is asking for damages in relation to it. And this ties into what the judge said in um, the argument, which we don't turn up again, like it's, it's um, supplementary number in tab 3, page 38 that we looked at earlier on, where he, he identified that it was because the interest in issue is reputation as opposed to a, an actual physical injury, that the outward relationship to the world that that person's reputation has is so important. <coughs> uh, perhaps the best example of this is in, in, in the authorities is actually in Broom and Castle itself. If you could take that out, which is tab two, that same authority fund, on page 1071. This is in the familiar section that you've already seen about the subjective elements in, the damage, in damages. Yes. And it's the quote from the Uren and John Fairfax, Australian case in the middle of the page just before D and the quote from the Uren case was that it says it seems to me that properly speaking a man defamed does not get compensation for his damaged reputation he gets damages because he was injured in his reputation that is simply because he was publicly defamed 
For this reason, compensation by damages operates in two ways, as a vindication of the plaintiff to the public and as consolation to him for a wrong done. And then at, um, just below there, immediately after E, Lord Helsham says, this is why it's not necessarily <coughs> fair to compare awards of damages in this field with damages for personal injury. Now, and that, that was not a statement limited to exemplary damages in this field at that point. He was talking about <coughs> the approach to damages, general damages generally. And then we see in um, G to H, same page, that where the examples are given here of the claimant's conduct as being relevant to assessment of damages, they are not stated as being closed categories. So he says just below F, this is what it meant, this is what is meant when the damages in defamation are defined as being at large. Um, he then talks about the punitive or exemplary nature of the ones that they are principally focused on. And he says just that they, they need to be proportionate to his conduct, just as they can be reduced if the defendant has behaved well, as, for instance, by a handsome apology, or the plaintiff badly, as, for instance, by provoking the defendant or defaming him in return. And that then he goes on to cite the passage from Craig and Graham, which we looked at this morning, where um, we clarified that it was Lord Hailsham who had put the statement in parenthesis there, I would personally add, and of the plaintiff. So, so what, what um, Lord Hailsham was saying, to put it in different te te terminology, is that unlike personal injury damages, uh, libel damages have a discursive aspect, which speaks not just as between the parties, but to the outside world, with a purpose that is compensatory, perhaps, but um, in a different way. Yes. Uh, and the, the judgments are all take as read, that um, the vindication will be outward facing. Yeah, well, don't, well, you don't really get much vindication by community secrets. By just telling yourself, no. I mean, statements in open court are another manifestation yeah. of it. The purpose is the same, it's to get out the message. But that's not, not necessarily inconsistent with the general principle of compensation. No. It's just a mm. peculiar feature mm. of what damages in this field are trying to achieve. Mm. The means in this field are, are slightly peculiar, perhaps. Um, and they're certainly extremely fact sensitive. There's no question. And are there, are there other areas of law that? identify in which similar considerations would apply. Well, and all also mentioned the privacy. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, in some senses, any of the publication tools yes. uh, would be amenable to... Well, not necessarily. I mean, harassment is all about what happened to you rather than what other people thought about you. Um, oh, well, I mean, it could be a, public, a harassment... Yes, or harassment by publication, but the, it's the impact of harassment by publication is causing alarm, distress, being harassed, not um, having other people shun or avoid you. Yeah. Okay. Certainly, I mean, the purpose of damages for har harassment are quite different in the sense of not a vindicatory. Um, no. And, and whether whether damages for misuse of private information are vindicatory is not an area we need to go into. No, luckily that's not. <laughs> that's um, right. In, anything else in Broome? Uh, yes, I would like to take you just a few more citations in Broome while we're in it. Um, on 1072, the next page, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see right at the bottom, G to H, there's another citation from Urenberg, yes. um, which you, your, your lordships and you can read for yourselves. It's just another part of how broad the at-large nature is of defamation. Thank you. 
you get it similarly on the next page, uh, at C, where he, the Lord Helsham refers to a similar ambiguity occurring in actions of defamation, the expression at large, punitive and so forth, lead to inextricable, inextricable confusion. But then at G, he says, the expression at large should be used in general to cover all cases where awards of damages may include elements for loss of reputation, injured feelings, and then this is very important, bad or good conduct by either party. Not limited or qualified by reference to provocation or any of the examples given on page 1071. And then it, he says, for punishment and where in consequence no precise limit can be set in extent. Mm. Now, the word punishment there is clearly directed, is it, to the question exemplary. of exemplary damage? Oh, I think it must be. Yeah, so, so why should we necessarily assume that Lord Hailsham, when he refers to bad or good conduct by other party, is referring to general damage? Uh, well, because this whole section is about um, damages overall, starting on page um, 1070, under the heading Subjective Element in Damages. Mm. And he's analysing the approach generally in order to get to grips with what the correct approach should be for exemplary. And the phrase, at large, is clearly intended to be and has been used throughout, uh, as it was on page 1071 where he said damages and defamation are described as being at large. Uh, so it, in, my, in my submission, that, that D has been used in the same way, the description of general damages, which is why it also talks about what it covers, such as loss of reputation, injured feelings, and so forth. That's yes. not specific to exemplary. Right, thank you. Um, is, that, is that broom, then? One more reference in Broome, page 1077, just to note, again in Lord Hailsham, where he refers to, again, one of the functions, the features of libel damages, is awarding for loss of reputation, injured feelings, and also outraged morality, which we suggest fits with the sense that this is a public-facing war, sending a message. And so the sense of being, having outraged morality when the court has found that he's carried out a deception on it is thought to be rather inconsistent. Right. Uh, and then finally, and I can just give you the note of this, in Grobola, there are, there are also um, various statements that tend to show the breadth of the principle as to what can come into play as being relevant to reducing damage. In the holding at number two, in the law, which is tab three, where it said there was no justification for a court to award substantial damages to a person shown to have no reputation deserving of legal reputation, which is one of my little points from earlier, I think. And the seized conduct is demonstrated in the evidence before the jury has destroyed the value of his reputation. But again, short of a justification case. Uh, and then at page 40, paragraph 24, they talk about court of defamation protecting those whose reputation to be unlawful and is affording little or no protection to those who have or deserve to have no reputation deserving of protection. Bobelar was cited by Mr. Justice Freeman <coughs> in Spiller Post's judgment at paragraph 4. And indeed, in the judge's judgment below, uh, in the consequentials, he referred to vindication of the moral, moral element. Um, and that's on the broom reference, which I'll just go to. Last point before briefly turning to um, Campbell's position, I'm going to be very quick on Campbell, um, is just the separate ground for reducing damages in relation to the goading. Mm. Um, the Support for the clear principle, I'm not sure what's, this is actually controversial or challenged, that evidence of the payment provocation may be relevant to reduce damages is obviously Broome at 1071 
Blimey now at paragraph 129, and rhyming at, um, let's discuss it in 155, 57. Right. Uh, so, quickly coming on to the question of um, Young and Bristol Aeroplane, mm -hmm. and the status of the Campbell judgment as far as this court is concerned. I mean, our position, obviously, is that this court is bound by Campbell, and that the judge was as well, even though obviously it wasn't cited in practical terms. The relevant proposition in Campbell is the one at 32 to 33, for the purposes of this appeal, and I don't think, again, that's controversial. This is where they say, if the defendant's conduct goes up to an including the trial itself may aggravate damages because of its effect on the claimant's feelings, can a claimant's conduct up to an including the trial reduce damages? And they answer yes. It, it's clear, we suggest, that Campbell was following the established uh, principle, uh, as I've sought to demonstrate by taking you through some of the authority particularly Broom and Castle, and what Lord Hailsham said, which is I suggested at 107.1 and 107.3 of um, Broom and Castle, is not limited to the claimant's conduct as a uh, provocation. And on that basis, um, we suggest that Campbell is perfectly good and consistent and you'll also see, if you go back to paragraph 26 of Campbell, that this is where they refer to Jones and Pollard and the list of the factors governing libel damages, which were first set out in Jones and Pollard, which I'm quickly to, which received the um, approval of the court there and in this case. Yes, so, so I think you would say that uh, if anything is binding on this court, it's certainly Jones and Pollard. Yes, and, and, and I'm, I'm not aware that there's any um, challenge to or qualification coming from the other side to what Jones and Pollard said. It's the pamphlet Jones and Pollard line is, is the clearest piece of that threat. Um, just to deal with the um, Four Seasons point, of that being raised latterly, um, and the contention that Campbell is not binding on him because it wasn't argued. Yes. Um, what one has to start with is, in fact, the earlier decision of Hadeen, which is at tab three of the supplemental authority. And, um, I'm sorry, I've, which, which case did you say? It's, can, it's our, our Kadim against Brent housing. It's so the main house. Main, sorry, oh, sorry. It's, 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 it's the joint yeah. authority. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's my fault. Tab three. <coughs> yeah. uh, and if you go to <coughs> page 965 of the report, the penultimate page, under the heading, the rule is to issues assumed without argument. That? Sorry, which page? It's, well, it's page 965, top right. Yeah. One, three, four. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And the heading is at B. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I'll leave you to read this at your leisure. But the key, po po the key point about this is that although this recognises uh, that there may be a way around precedent if it's the case that the proposition of law had been assumed by. Mm. and wasn't the subject of argument, you mm. see in paragraph 33, yeah. it's important to focus on paragraphs 38 and 39, which look at the ambit of the rule and say, like all exceptions to a modification of the strict rule of precedent, this rule must be only applied in the most obvious cases and limited with great care. And then um, that condition, the basis of this is that the proposition in question must have been assumed, not have been the subject 
decision. That condition will almost always only be fulfilled when the point has not been expressly raised before the court. There's been no argument upon it. And then drop down to B. There may, of course, be cases, perhaps many cases, where a point has not been the subject of argument, but scrutiny of the judgment indicates that the court's acceptance of the point went beyond mere assumption. Very little is likely to be required to draw that latter conclusion. So um, we rely on that to say that if you go back to Campbell, the, the very least that can be said about um, Campbell is it's not possible to be definitive as to whether the point was fully argued. And I quite take the point that the payment was in person. But having said that, also seems to be perfectly conceivable that it was properly argued. And if you start at paragraphs 8 and 9 are where you were taken this morning, 8 is the one that makes it clear it was common ground in relation to um, aggravated damages. 9, which starts with the word by contrast, which I accept is ambiguous, but it certainly doesn't say that uh, it was common ground in relation to the issue going the other way about mm. whether mm. Uh, damages could be reduced because of the payments conduct. If you then factor in the fact that at paragraph 26, which we've seen a few times, the court clearly did consider uh, Jones and Pollard and um, the list of factors, the consideration behind those factors at 26. And then you look at 30 which makes clear that they think that in that case um, the greater relevance of the various factors is the question of the evidence being admissible and the authority of counsel. And then in 32, they raise a rhetorical question. Can a claimant's conduct up to and including the trial reduce damages? And they answer it yes in 32. So um, it would appear that on balance, it's much more strongly likely that they did not least because Jones and Pollard was before them as well, uh, and they reached their decision on that basis, which makes it not only, as I've said already, in accordance with correct principles, um, but clearly uh, in relation to young disclarity and binding on this court, and exceptions are not made out. The, the only thing I'm going to just say finally about um, Al Hack and Summers yeah. is that it's a very short point. Those are not libel cases, as, as um, the law thinks maybe is very well aware. There was no consideration at all in those cases about any of the particular issues arising in respect of assessment of libel damages, thought that we've been considering. And uh, uh, as one of you said this morning, that's not surprising because they were personal injury cases. And the approach is different. I mean, that's, that's how it is when it comes to the actual measurement uh, and the objective of what the damages are for. So quite apart from the fact that in those cases they weren't looking at damages anyway, they were looking at other sanctions in the world of commerce, such as strikeouts, costs, Contempt, strike out after trial. They were not considering any of these, the niceties of the issues of vindication and the appropriateness of certain levels of reward in light of interference with the interest in the case, in other words, the reputation, as opposed to the physical broken foot. So, on that basis, we consider that those cases are red herrings anyway, but they certainly have no impact on Campbell at all. Well, can I, can I suggest a possible way of analysing this? So, just so you can tell me if I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. Uh, could it be said that actually there's no conceptual difference of principle between the two lines of authority at all? That in each context what one is doing is the general purpose of the law of torts, which is to put the claimant in the position 
that they would have been in if the wrong had not been committed. And the way in which the law does that is principally through giving them damages. It gives them damages for the harm actually caused, not for something else. And then, in, in, then it all depends on the context. Those are the general principles, potentially. The context in the case of a broken leg is different from a broken reputation. And therefore, we come back to the discussion we had about half an hour ago, that in the context of defamation, it's not that there's anything conceptually different as a matter of principle. It's just that the nature of the harm is different. And therefore, you still don't compensate for something that you haven't, in fact, suffered. Yes, I completely accept that. I think that's a fair summary. And, and I mean, the other way of just looking at what is different is it's the means of how you carry out the assessment yes. and what's relevant within the means. Because that is where there is a peculiarity in the sense that, you know, this question of common sector yes. is not something that comes up in personal injury for obvious no, reasons. Right. It's, not, it's not relevant. Yes, I see. But it, it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be underplayed in our position. It's very important in this field, yes. but without interfering with the with the common principle. Yes. Uh, uh, before we leave the precedent point, did, did you have an opportunity to look at Jastel? I'm not. I'm not suggesting it's of any importance, but I just wanted. We we did have a very brief look. We didn't think that it, it right. was quite on all fours of the, right. That's the, fine. the situation in this case. Well, only friend made. No, as, no, as long as it's been considered. No, no, it was very helpful to, to see it. And, and it was nice and short, so we were able to, to look at it quite quickly. Through the passages of your judgment. Yes. But no, we didn't We didn't think that the, the problems thrown up in that case came anywhere near what we regard as a lack of a problem. Right, thank you very much. Um, may I just turn my back for one moment? Of course. Thank you very much. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Yes, Lord Wolfson, would you like to reply? Uh, my Lord, my Lady, uh, yes, although briefly, really, for two reasons. First, the normal reason, which is the reply is not meant to be an opportunity to regurgitate all of one's submissions. And I was given some indulgence by the court this morning. Uh, secondly, because the points, as often, if I may say, respectfully, in cases like this, are really narrow. Uh, and um, the court has plainly got I'm going to say a good grip of the essential point now which lies points now which lie between us. So really just a few points in reply without I hope regurgitating all of my uh, submissions. Uh, first, the respondent's case appears now to be that what would be normally regarded as no more than an element of partial truth going to dishonesty actually results in the proposition that my client is deserving of no reputation whatsoever and therefore gets nominal damages. There are a number of problems with my respectful submission. First of all, it's not, as I sought to submit this morning, the way the learned judge approached the issue, and I think that's, I may say, that's clear from when one reads the judgment. Secondly, it's not justified by any evidence. That's a point I've already submitted, and I won't. Third, there is no respondent's notice. I mean, I'm not taking that as a very technical point, but it is important in a case like this if a respondent is really going to say, well, the judge got it wrong, I accept the judge got it wrong, or even in my alternative case, I accept the judge may have got it wrong, but here's a completely different basis for supporting the judgment. There ought to be a respondent's notice, and there isn't one. Of course, another point that comes out of that is that we won on serious harm. It is a little difficult, I would submit, at one and the same time to say the claimant won on serious harm, but actually at the same time to say that the claimant has no reputation at all. Now, that is not a criticism of the judgment, because in the judgment, the reason why we were knocked back or knocked out, knocked out actually, on damages in the judgment, is not because we didn't have a reputation. 
It's because we would have got substantial damages because we did win on the libels, we did win on serious harm, we did have a reputation to be compensated for, or vindicated, to use that word, but because we'd behaved so badly, we got a hand. So this is not a criticism of the, of, of the judgment, but with respect, it's a criticism of the way my learned friend now seeks to put the case. And I don't think she grappled with the point that we won on serious harm. And it's not clear to me from her submissions whether she's actually saying the judge was therefore wrong about this, and we shouldn't have won on serious harm. The, the, the policy, in my respectful submission, is that wrongdoing is marked by awarding, as I said earlier, indemnity costs, com committing for contempt, um, but um, it's not uh, by reducing damages to uh, a nominal sum. The third and perhaps last point, subject to my laws and my lady questions, if there are any, uh, is really to identify that in some of these authorities we looked at the word uh, unconscionable earlier. There are words like appropriate, unconscionable, deserved, or reputation deserving of protection. One does have to distinguish, this really goes perhaps to the heart of my submission, between when you say deserving of reputation, are you actually quantifying the reputation, which goes to my Lord Lord Justice Singh's point, well, we're really trying to put a monetary figure on an intangible concept. Well, are you doing what the learner judge did in this case, which is to say, although I can put a monetary figure on an intangible concept, you don't deserve it. I mean, there's the old, um, the old magistrate's bench where they say, well, we, you know, we, we do find that uh, for, for the defendant that on, on the uh, the burden of proof and the presumption of innocence and the benefit of the doubt. But we don't think that this defendant deserves any benefit of the doubt. Well, you can't do that. If you have a reputation in, in general damages, you've got to get it. And that's why words like deserving, unconscionable, imply a moral judgment, or a discretionary judgment, perhaps is a better word, in a court of law. Whereas general damages are, is a legal concept and a, and a pretty hard-edged legal concept. As I said in my submissions, it can be difficult to ascertain, and it can sometimes be fuzzy in terms of calculation, but it's a hard-edged point. You could take an example from another area of the law in a surveyor's negligence case, whether the property is in fact worth 150000 or 160000 it can be difficult to ascertain, but once the court has ascertained it, that's a hard-edged decision. It's not a discretion given to the judge may be difficult to put a figure on it, but once a judge has done it, everything else then runs from that true value. And here also, one is, one is asking the question, what is the true value, so to speak, of the reputation? Now, of course I accept, in the law of defamation, that there are points which go to the true value of the reputation and do not offend the restitutio principle. And I, I hope I was making that very clear in my submission. Hamplin, facts which have emerged, partial truth, all go to that point, which uh, my Lord Lord Justice Singh uh, and other members of the court put to myself, I'm a learned friend, on a number of occasions. I'm not dissenting from that at all. But there are two points. First of all, those concepts in the authorities, or those routes to reducing general damages, are carefully, and I submit properly, circumscribed. It's not just a, put it all in the pot and give it a big stir and see what you think. It's not that at all. Secondly, even when one is talking about dishonesty, I do submit respectfully there is all the difference in the world between a libel saying that you're dishonest about something which goes to who you are and whether you've lied to your spouse about an affair or lied about a speeding ticket, or even lied to the court about overseas conferences. So although my primary submission to the court is that we don't get into this area at all, if we do, we certainly don't get into it to an extent that it gets you down to a pound. And in the terms of this case, because of the gravity of the libel, because of the limitation in the claim form to £100,000, even if contrary to my primary case, the dishonesty, so to speak, comes in because it is in some way relevant. 
because the threshold is 100,000, it operates above that level anyway. So in terms of the damages recoverable here, it would actually have no effect. But those are all submissions I made earlier on, and I, I do want to restrain myself from uh, repeating uh, my earlier submissions. So um, if I could just check with my loan junior. Well. Yeah, perhaps I can just add, I was making the point that uh, damages are, so to speak, a hard-edged figure. They're a question of law and not a matter of discretion. Another way of putting that is that um, in the uh, convention sense, uh, damages for libel balance, essentially, Article 8, Article uh, 10. Uh, and uh, in, in those senses as well, um, those are matters of obligation and not matters of discretion. I think that may be another way of putting uh, the same point. Uh, so unless the court has any uh, questions uh, for me, those are our submissions in the slide. Just one point, if I may. Um, I was interested in the submission you just made, which was you said that the, the law has uh, other options open to it for um, dealing with dishonesty, uh, an award of indemnity costs or um, contempt punishment and so forth. Uh, I was trying to square that submission with the, it's open to award indemnity costs with the position that you wish to reserve, which is that even if you win, you want to be able to argue that you should get um, your cost below. But my lady, I, 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 I identified this point earlier in my submissions. I think I was taking it quite quickly, so I probably didn't make it as clear as I should have been. I, was, I accepted in my primary submission that this court, even if it's with me, would, on my case, be able to say, mm. you're right, so to speak, on the 100,000. You've got over the precedent point. Yeah. You are, in terms of money, now the winner. But I'm still not going to disturb the indemnity cost order because you behave badly. I, 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 did, I hope I, I accepted that in my primary submissions. I think I was doing it quite quickly. But I certainly do accept that. All I was asking for is that if the court is with me, we should at least perhaps on one side of A4 be given an opportunity to try to persuade the court to interfere or to revisit that cost order. But I accept that it, doesn't, it won't necessarily follow in the way that it might all usually necessarily follow if the court was to disturb the order of the trial judge. So I'm not seeking to sort of have my cake and eat it. I, I absolutely accept that I can win this appeal and still have an indemnity cost bill. I, I hope that's made that clear. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very grateful. May I address everyone through you, Lord Wilson? We're very grateful all concerned, not only the advocates, but everyone who's prepared and presented this very interesting case. Uh, we will reserve our judgments. Uh, the judgments will be circulated in the usual way in draft on a strictly confidential basis. And I do need to emphasize, in, the least, in light of recent authority from this court, how important it is that the strict embargo should be complied with. Uh, the purposes for circulating it in draft are very limited, primarily to correct any factual errors and typographical errors. It's certainly not an opportunity to argue the case again, and we anticipate that if there are any uh, consequential matters which can't be agreed between the parties in the light of the draft judgments, that we will deal with those in writing. And uh, then the final judgment will be handed down almost certainly uh, remotely online. May I just check if there's anything else before we go? Thank you very much. We're very grateful.